Greetings, friends. On behalf of Capella Romana and St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary, we are pleased to welcome you to this discussion. Let my prayer arise, music in the experience of African-American Orthodox Christians. My name is Rob Saylor, and I teach religion and culture at Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. I'm also a proud board member of Capella Romana and a longtime friend and fan of the Institute of Sacred Arts at St. Vladimir's Seminary. I'll be serving as moderator for this conversation. I'd like to begin by inviting Dr. Alexander Lingus, the founder and artistic director of Capella Romana, to say some words. Alex? Thank you. I'd also like to extend my own welcome to the first in a series of online panels during the spring of 2021 that Capella Romana will be presenting in cooperation with academic partner institutions. These panels represent an extension of Capella Romana's pastoral and research work in the field of Orthodox liturgical music, especially its efforts to shed light on historically significant moments of creativity and cultural encounter from the ancient past to the modern present. This evening, it is my honor to be with you for this panel, Let My Prayer Arise, Music in the Experience of African-American Orthodox Christians, which as has already been said, is graciously co-sponsored by the Institute of Sacred Arts at St. Vladimir Seminary. Let me turn you back over to our moderator, Professor Saylor. Thank you, Alexander. Our topic today encompasses a range of issues celebration of artistic excellence, dialogue about the depths of spiritual experience found throughout the church. And we are also mindful as we gather of the ways in which the Orthodox Church in the United States, like the rest of this country, is currently carrying out its mission in the context of a national reckoning around matters of race. As we approach this Lenten season, we are reminded that if there is to be true reconciliation and peace, it must be built upon a foundation of truth telling. And finally, always on our minds is the way that music and the arts can build bridges across the church. Is there ecumenical potential in the sacred arts that is different from but complementary to theological dialogue? All of these and more are areas that we may explore during our panel discussion today. And I'm very excited at the speakers who have agreed to join the conversation. Let me introduce them briefly, and then after that, I'll give them a chance to say more about themselves. Father Turbo Qualls is the Dean of Chapters for the National Chapter of the Fellowship of St. Moses the Black. He's lectured in various parts of the United States in regard to the work of evangelization and cultural outreach within the U.S. As a former youth minister within the Evangelical Church, Father Turbo has dedicated much of his life and work to the pragmatic and tangible articulation of Orthodox spirituality to both young people and spiritual seekers. And he currently serves as the priest of St. Mary of Egypt Serbian Orthodox Church in Kansas City, Missouri. Mother Catherine Weston was brought up in the Episcopal Church and converted to the Orthodox faith in the 1980s, drawn by the beauty of the icons and the music. She has been a nun for 32 years and is the superior of the St. Zinia monastic community in Indianapolis for most of that time. In the 1990s, she was active in the fight against present day slavery and human trafficking, but this led to a concern for the psychological trauma that may persist even after securing freedom. This in turn led her to earn a master's degree in counseling from Christian Theological Seminary and launch a private counseling practice where she specializes in trauma-informed care. She's also a founding member and president of the Fellowship of St. Moses the Black, as well as being a regular speaker at their annual conference, and she's published five books based on those presentations. Dr. Sean Wallace is the Director of Jazz Studies and Associate Professor of Jazz Saxophone at The Ohio State University. He also serves as Minister of Music and Worship Arts at Second Baptist Church. At Ohio State, he leads the Ohio Jazz Tech, which is the jazz faculty group, the Ohio Show Band, and the University Jazz Ensemble. He's been seen and heard nationally on a variety of outlets, and in addition to receiving recognitions from many newspapers and publications, including Billboard and Contemporary Christian Music Magazine, he is the winner of Downmeat Magazine's Outstanding Soloist Award. He's released eight CDs, at least as of the time of this bio, as a multi-instrumentalist and as the leader of the Dr. Thunder Quartet. 
Dr. Peter Bateniev is professor of systematic theology at St. Vladimir's Seminary, where he's taught for 20 years. He co-founded the Arvo Pert Project, and he's also the founding director of the Institute of Sacred Arts, which again is co-sponsoring this discussion. He's the author of a number of books in the areas of systematic theology, as well as theology of the arts, including two books and multiple articles on the composer Arvo Pert. His teaching, publications, and public speaking all reflect a love of the arts and a commitment to engage them theologically. Now, having given the on-paper bios of our distinguished friends today, I'd like to invite them to put some flesh on those bones and to say more about themselves and their ministries in the church, especially as it relates both to sacred arts and matters of racial reconciliation and justice. Father Turbo, may we start with you? Sure, sure. Um, well, I think primarily the where any type of uh, authentic influence, uh, at least for me, would come is more than my work um, here in Kansas City. I'll touch on that a in a little bit, but um, first and foremost, you know, um, I'm an Orthodox Christian who's a convert and an African American. So um, that experience um, is really the thing that drives my understanding. And I think that experience is also the the primary thing that informs uh, much of my work because that experience is an experience of connecting with God and with um, the power that music, um, in particular, as we're speaking about here, you know, sacred music can move and motivate and inspire someone. Um, you know, uh, here, our parish, we are located in Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, um, you know, just to give a little bit of context, is suffers from hyper segregation still. Um, and we uh, are actually nestled, we moved uh, a year ago, we're nestled uh, even further on the east side, which is, <clears throat> that's how it's divided. Um, east side is typically, you know, poor and black, and then the west side is not. Um, and so we're nestled now uh, in a neighborhood. And, you know, it's, it's the hood. And um, it's wonderful, <laughs> actually. Uh, we have a little arc here. And um, the, the history of this um, parish and this community, it, it, it's long standing, long before I was the priest. Um, and it's, its history is rooted in trying to actually incarnate this idea of reconciliation. And, and I think that the, the key movement uh, has been primarily around connection. And I would argue that this is probably the thing that we need to understand the most about music and that is the fact that it either connects or it doesn't connect with someone and beginning to understand what are the what are the means by which connection can happen because um although i you know i, I see myself a bit of like a you know a kind of neophyte mystic i think the reality is is that it's not all mystical meaning that there's actual things that can be done to facilitate that connection and i think a lot of the discussion um, around these issues um, gets obfuscated with uh, a certain lack of understanding and that there's a pragmat there's some pragmatic things that can be done um, and those things once they're done a lot of the work that um, continues to need to be done primarily in evangelization and which is the key means of reconciliation those things become really apparent and become a lot easier to to engage um, but it all begins with your experience first. You know, if I can't show someone the depth of the heart if I haven't been there myself first, and I can't explain to someone the value and the power of their suffering and the value and the power of being, you know, kind of in that dark night of the soul if I haven't been there myself first. So it's with those things of experience first, personal experience, and then having that be shaped and formed by tradition and, and you know, a, a more Catholic understanding, some really powerful things can happen. Thank you, Father Turbo. Mother Catherine, could you say more about how these issues intersect in your own life and ministry? Here we go, let me cut the chai. Um, so as far as the arts are concerned, I'm, I've been known primarily for iconography. Um, 
not as much for music, but um, music has been a lifelong interest and passion of mine. Um, I did not grow up singing in the choir, as so many African American uh, stories begin, but I did uh, sing in school choruses, um, learned guitar, uh, made compositions, learned how to notate music uh, because of that. And then in orthodoxy, have been in the Kleros uh, from the time I was a catechumen. So, also teaching other people how to do the services, all of that has been part of my orthodox journey. Um, I would say the first time that I began to intuit that there was a dialogue to be had between orthodox culture, uh, orthodox liturgical worship and the African-American expression was when I was still a catechumen in the 80s. When I did a little uh, skit that included a Vespers portion that used the, the, the scaffolding of the orthodox Vespers and then brought in uh, African-American elements, for instance, the Humanon based on they that wait on the Lord to renew their strength, things like that. So that was the beginning of wondering about how that dialogue could unfold. So I think I'll, I think I'll let it rest at that point. Marvelous. Well, there'll be more to say later on, I'm sure. But uh, Dr. Wallace, could you share how this intersection has played out in your own work? So anyhow, uh, I grew up in a non-denominational sort of tradition, um, by the way, which is another denomination uh, just called non-denominational. Uh, and, uh, you know, in that kind of tradition, there are certain kind of questions uh, that I had, that I always had, that I didn't really feel satisfied by the answers of. And so uh, when I was in college, I was a comparative religion minor. And as a comparative religion minor, I took uh, a Christian tradition course. It was taught by a an ex-Catholic -Catholic priest uh, who cussed like a sailor, by the way, uh, writing class. And uh, that was a uh, um, the, kind of an interesting experience, but uh, I was exposed to the reality that there was a, a, a church called the Orthodox Church that I was not aware of, and he started bringing up sort of issues of so, stuff like apostolic succession. It's not a term that I related to at all, but later on, as I became less and less satisfied with sort of uh, cons you know uh, answers that I was getting. Um, uh, a, a buddy of mine started sending me articles about the Orthodox Church, and I was totally hooked. Uh, as soon as I found out about it, I rushed I rushed right in to the Orthodox Church. It didn't take me very long. Um, I belonged to a church in uh, Columbus, Ohio, called St. Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, and, um, yeah, I mean, uh, right, right off, I, I saw that, you know, I thought that my music... Uh, my sort of experience with music, you know, I'm a I'm a jazz musician by uh, by training. Um, you know, I have several recordings out. I, I was like, I wonder if there's a way to sort of combine, you know, the experience I've had working in sort of Protestant churches with what's going on in uh, in the Orthodox Church. So, uh, 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 backed by uh, Lee Zappas, who uh, was very generous and uh, funded this project. Uh, we did this project called How Sweet the Sound, where um, uh, we we presented, you know, several selections of of a black gospel setting of a, of a, uh, uh, an Orthodox Vespers. And uh, 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 Dr. Peter Putenev was part of that. He was one of the presenters. And um, I, that's probably why you were interested in, in having me on the panel. So I'll stop, I'll stop there. Absolutely. That's, um, well, Dr. Petenyev, as you, um, Dr. Wallace said, you were involved in that, um, in that presentation of the Gospel Vespers. And then also in your capacity as director of the Institute of Sacred Arts, you think on these questions often of how the arts speak into the church. Um, tell us more about... Um, 
your thinking and experience with this in your own work. Yeah, um, thanks. It's so wonderful to be here among this beautiful company. And um, what Dr. Wallace, Dr. Thunder did not tell you is that he is the composer of that Vesper service and of uh, and of those uh, compositions that together constituted a Vesper service uh, in the Orthodox tradition, uh, but musically in the Black Gospel tradition. <clears throat> and my participation in that was um, a game changer for me uh, to just see what's possible in, in all of these kinds of things we're talking about today. Uh, it was extremely moving, and uh, I hope we can weave in some clips from that um, into this presentation. Uh, I'm a lifelong musician lifelong Orthodox Christian as well. I've always sung in choirs or conducted them. And uh, uh, I was educated at New England Conservatory in the late 70s and early 80s in jazz and in what was then called Third Stream. And uh, I, that's, I think, significant because uh, by definition, that program uh, involved some very, very deep ear training. Uh, so, which means listening, which, uh, I hope to get back to later on during this conversation, the importance of listening. And listening is everything. Uh, but then listening to uh, widely eclectic uh, musical traditions and, uh, and freely incorporating them into your own musical vocabulary uh, in whatever your own idiom is. Uh, you can be uh, either knowingly or unknowingly now somehow uh, incorporating the music of, of North India uh, the music of uh, of Ghana, uh, the music of the Javanese gamelan, you know, and so uh, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I was rooted in uh, in jazz, and and as a jazz musician like uh, Dr. Sean, I'm glad to see the basses behind you, Dr. Sean. I, I joined the club <laughs> here. <laughs> um, uh, you're conscious that there that there is that there are music traditions that have a kind of a lineage and they're related by lineage like uh like jazz and gospel and rhythm and blues and and you know so there, there's a kind of a, a a tie that you can point to historically and culturally but then there's also um as 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 father turbo said you know there's like you either music can either resonate with you or not it, it can either speak to you or not regardless of tradition and and so one of the really interesting things in this whole conversation is um, uh, what of each other's musical traditions uh, resonates, you know, what sounds good to you, you know, as a human being, but also as an African-American human being, you know, or, you know, uh, you know, uh, and, and you can find that resonance in, uh, in surprising places uh, if we all dare to listen to each other, you know, and so the, the work, um, that we're doing in the Institute of Sacred Arts, it has a lot to do with uh, listening across traditions, uh, looking across traditions. We're involved in some sort of very academic questions of like, in sacred arts, what does it mean that something is sacred? Uh, but we're not only asking, you know, kind of card carrying Orthodox Christians that question, we're as interested in what, uh, in what anyone says about that question. So, um, I'll leave it there. I'm just so happy to be talking with everyone here. Well, and you know, I think I want to pick up on just that exact word resonance. Um, the, you know, there's maybe a stodgy way of asking the question, you know, how does the Orthodox musical tradition dialogue with African American musical traditions? But I think maybe the better way to ask it, based on what you all have said, is when we think about these rich historical streams of music coming from different vantage points across the globe and from within this country. What is it that you have found and have experienced as resonant between Eastern Orthodox musical condition, traditions and African-American musical traditions, however construed? What, what resonate, what speaks across those traditions? And I'm going to throw that open to whoever would like to answer first. Um, I'll, I'll jump. I'll jump in. Um, so, one thing I I've, I have uh, found greatly interesting 
is, so I'm the minister of music at a, at a missionary Baptist church. Now understand that a missionary Baptist church is not the same as like an evangelical Baptist church, right? Or like a Southern Baptist church or something. Um, a missionary Baptist church, which is a black church, tends to be a black church, um, uh, there is a much more developed liturgy. There is a much more reverence of, uh, so, so as far as what clothing is worn, the choir all have robes on, you know, the minister has a robe on, you know, when he's preaching often is the case. Um, in any given service, uh, I'm programming 14 or 15 selections. And so the music is rather um, woven throughout the service in a way that is not usually the case in like a like a mega church or something. You know, uh, like a maybe a mega church, you, maybe you'd have like worship in the beginning of the service, worship. So, you know, praise and worship, you'd have maybe 20 minutes or something, 15 minutes, and then you'd have maybe announcements and then um, maybe some uh, special selection or something, then the sermon. And then after the sermon, you probably have sort of either uh, sort of some kind of altar call s selection or something like that. But understand that basically the music is rather segregated from the service, right? It has its own space, but it's not really intertwined with the rest of the service. But not so in a missionary Baptist church. In a missionary Baptist church, uh, the organ, uh, in, in particular, the organ is sort of through composed over the, over the entire service. In fact, uh, during the sermon, so say the beginning of the sermon, uh, organ is probably playing. And then maybe once the minister says the prayer or does the scripture reading, then organist will stop. The sermon, whatever it is, three points, <laughs> usually, right? Three or four points. And then at the end of the service, something happens called tuning up. Now, tuning up is when the organist will have a certain kind of relationship with uh, the minister. They'll know what key that they tend to sing in, what key they their preaching suggests, and they'll start there. And often it's the case that there will be successive modulations. And the preacher is intense. He is driving home whatever the central point was in the sermon. And the organ is playing on top of, in between, um, you know, all kinds of things, right? Uh, so my point is, is that there's, I think there's a, a great deal in common with the way that an Orthodox service is, where the music is throughout. It's indistinguishable, indistinguishable from uh, the words spoken, from the content right? It's all one thing. It's very holistic, right? Um, so I find that uh, that was one of the things immediately when I walked into an Orthodox church, I was like, oh, snap, you know, this, <laughs> I, I see what's, you know, yeah, the aesthetic is different. You know, the, the, uh, you know, acapella singing for the most part, that's different. There's aspects that are different, but there is so much that is the same when you get get beyond those sort of superficial differences. Marvelous. Other thoughts on this? Yeah. Mother Catherine? I, I found that's, um, am I unmuted? Yep. Yeah. Okay, I found that so very interesting, uh, what Dr. Sean Wallace was saying. And um, the, before he spoke, the only, the, the main resonance I would say was in the spirit 
of the sorrowful joy that you would find both in African American worship and in the Orthodox worship um, more than the musicality itself, but the, the underlying spirit, I think, is is an important starting point as well. Can you tell us more what you mean by sorrowful joy? I think that's such an important concept here. Yeah. Um, it's not a triumphalism. It's not a patting myself on the back because I'm a uh, Christian and, and I'm saved and I know I'm saved. It's, um, it's reaching out from the valley of the shadow of death sometimes with Christ being what pulls us through or prayers to the Theotokos, what gives us courage for day-to-day -day life. And so we're able to experience joy in the midst of sorrow as opposed to um, a prosperity gospel. It's very different from a prosperity gospel. I, I should have been playing the organ while you were talking there at the end there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 and if I may, uh, Dr. Bittini, if I know that this bright sorrow, sorrowful joy, that's something you've been thinking about in terms of the Orthodox tradition in your own writings. Would you agree that, that there's that particular resonance there? Uh, very, very deeply so. Uh, there's one line uh, that we sing at Resurrection Matins. Uh, we sing, Lo, through the cross, joy has come into all the world. <laughs> it's such a mind-blowing line because what is the cross? It is, it's an instrument of, of death and, and torture. Uh, and, and somehow, <laughs> there it is. Uh, joy comes through it. And uh, when I was listening to both um, Mother Catherine and, and Dr. Wallace talking, I was, uh, it, one of the factors that united your, what you said, well, two of them, <laughs> was a kind of an integration of, of music and message, music and preaching. And, um, and the other is a, a kind of truth telling that, that um, the, the liturgy and, and the arts, they don't sugarcoat anything. Um, they're about the, the raw reality that is true, uh, both to the joy and to the sorrow. Uh, and, and it's like uh, we human beings have solidarity with each of those. And we're invited into Christ's uh, sorrow and Christ's joy. You know, So through him, our own sorrow and our own joy is just somehow made fulfilled. And, and since we're all uh, in him, then we all share in each other's uh, sorrow and joy. And, uh, it, it's impossible to um, express how, how how profound and beautiful that is. I, you know, I take note too that um, uh, Albert Rabateau, uh, who's a very dear friend um, and um, another African American convert to the Orthodox Church from the Catholic Church, uh, he wrote a kind of a spiritual autobiography, uh, and the title of it is "Sorrowful Joy." <laughs> it's no coincidence. It's a very beautiful. Uh, testimony uh, to his life uh, as an African-American, as an Orthodox Christian, uh, and as someone trying to make sense of all of these things. That's stunning. Father Turbo, I wonder, um, in your own work, and as you've talked about this, how have you found it best to describe the way in which these different streams come together, these different historical and musical streams? What are, what are some helpful, evocative ways to think about that in your own ministry? Um, well, I mean, first of all, obviously, I want to just echo um, what Dr. Bittidef was saying. Um, and also, I mean, um, Dr. Sean's input was actually very fascinating. Um, if I could, I just really want to comment on that for a second. Before Please. Um, because one of the, one of the things in, in my short time of really um, contemplating, but being in, in a place to um, try things or to really have my contemplation actually move forward in any meaningful way. One of the problems has always been a lack of understanding of how, um, and again, I'll, I'll use the word in kind of almost strategic sense, 
how that intersection would be even possible. And so um, that was very insightful, actually. And and I find that that's um, one of the things that's very important, but it also leads me to an understanding of something else, which is I think the the differences and and um, this is again from my own limited experience, but one of the big differences is that kind of starting point. So Dr. James Cohn, many years ago, I, I, I want to say, gosh, it is maybe the minimum 15 years ago, there was a conference um, that Tavis Smiley um, was uh, moderating. I can't remember if he's the one who actually put it on, but in that conference, he was speaking about um, how the reality of the loss of the cross for the black church, the 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 reality of the black church, um, he's speaking in a more generalized sense, um, you know, caring more, trying to preserve itself in a worldly sense, um, in the sense of success, as opposed to losing its life. Um, he he presented this and it set the, it set the room on fire. And I bring that up because I think um, this is one of the things that we have to understand, which is um, there needs to be a portion, which Dr. Sean articulated incredibly well. I'm, I'm still really kind of thinking about what he, talked, what he said, but there's this portion of, of really how do we approach it? Because, um, you know, I, I've been playing when I was in, <laughs> I was a music major before I left that. and. Um, at my little my, my little time there, there was jazzers, there was the classical guys, and there was the street guys, right? And so I was one of the street guys, and the street guys were the ones who played in bands, and you know, did all that stuff, and they found themselves for usually trying to be in recording or production. That's why I was there. But I played in bands my whole life, uh, rock bands, right? And my dad owned a record store, and. I grew up immersed in music. Music was was my culture, was and subculture is my culture, fundamentally. Um, I learned how to move in this world. Um, it, it 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 was a chariot. It was a a a piece of armor. Um, it was camouflage. Subculture and music, in particular, allowed me to move in the world at times when. Um, other aspects of my quote unquote identity were maybe more vulnerable than I would like. You know, growing up in a predominantly white um, area um, or oftentimes being, you know, whatever it is, always having that kind of acute awareness of, of being like the lone guy. I found the arts uh, in general, I'm also an artist, but music and the culture that I grew up with, again, my father having a record store, it, it opened up an understanding in a way to see the world that wasn't tied to the same measures of success as everyone else. This is something that I found resonating when I had my conversion, when I, when I was beginning to follow Christ. And I went to my mom's missionary Baptist church, by the way. And there was something different there. And it was different than my grandmother's Episcopalian church, right? There was, uh, I almost would say, there was, you know, a kind of an all in aspect to it. And that all in aspect was at least the people that I had contact with at my mom's missionary Baptist church, there was like a seriousness that was there. Um, and there was a, an almost other otherworldliness that was there that I didn't experience again, like at my grandmother's Episcopalian church, or, you know, I went to, um, you know, an Assembly of God church high school. You know, I was went to a, a private school uh, in grade school, Assembly of God. I didn't experience that same type of thing. So, this this experience of my father owning a record store, growing up in music, you know, playing in bands, being in an underground scene. These, this common thread for me was that music can become this, again, like I said, a chariot which can move you through spaces. It can become armor which can allow you to move, move through spaces with a certain amount of protection, a certain amount of awareness. And it facilitates a self-awareness that I think both orthodoxy and 
the root of African American experience have really in common. See, and this is this is where to weave it all through suffering, and an awareness of suffering, and a um, a refusal to avoid suffering, whether it's going to be through, you know, prosperity teaching, you know, kind of a false ecstatic experience. Um, any of those things that people can use to avoid the acute pain of that deep reflection, it's very powerful. And this is what Dr. Cohn was getting at. You know, maybe not necessarily in the specific context of the music, but this is what he was getting at in regards of where he felt the, the quote unquote black church had gone wrong. Um, and this is where, you know, in our best points, what is, where are we at our best points as Orthodox Christians? during Lent, right? What's what's Lent all about? It's about not, we're supposed to not flinch the whole year round as Orthodox Christians. But during Lent in particular, we learn really not to flinch. And we really learn to kind of stare everything, including primarily ourselves in the face with a steely eye. That generates something musically. And I think that when you now understand that, and that needs to be the focus that you don't leave from, then your technical understanding of modes and all the, all the aspects of how you actually create music are now properly in service of where you're trying to get to. But you have to have the, the, you have to have the horse to drive the chariot, not the other way around. And I think that that's, that will probably be, or at least should be that common thread that's gonna guide this discussion not just for this forum today, but in the future, is this understanding of maintaining that tension of that joyful sorrow, because it's not morose. It isn't, it isn't this kind of, you know, a despondency. It's, it's different, but it is that tension that I think really allows people to enter into something that is powerful and moving, you know? And, and, I, and again, moving like a chariot, not moving like a, an emotional experience. It's different. It's different. It's something that motivates you into something profoundly different. This, when you're, when you are being moved like a chariot by music, you become something else. You, you're able to enter into a space where you can embody something higher. You can change yourself and, and the world around you for good. Um, and that is something that I think music and in particular you know music in a sacred space is that's its whole that's its whole purpose right but if you don't keep that focus well then you know you're dealing with something else peter I just wonder I, i'm grateful for that uh father turbo uh there's so much uh in what you just said and i just want to test something on on you and on others it is one thing that I'm hearing that, you know, on the one hand, there are different idioms, uh, uh, musical idioms uh, within a worshiping church. You know, there's a Slavic Orthodox idiom. There's a Byzantine Orthodox idiom. There is there is a number of different idioms in historic black churches um, with some overlap and some not. And, and so um, it is part of what all of us in a way may are, are saying is that uh, there's another level uh, to all this that transcends idiom. And that level is uh, words like you just used, Father Turbo, unflinching, um, words like truth telling, words like sorrowful joy, joyful sorrow. Um, it, it's the character such that if, if someone is either uh, intoning in a very kind of a historical kind of Byzantine chant, or someone is singing kind of a four part Slavic harmony kind of a thing, or if someone is singing in a, in a kind of a black gospel influenced mode, it's like, that's, that's just the clothing. Mm -hmm. And, and there's something inside that, that is capable potentially of resonating with all of us across the traditions. Is that too bold a thing to suggest? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I like that idea. Um, you know, I'm very... And... And that's not to say... That's not to say that there's no difference 
um, and that the aesthetic doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that, but it does mean that um, we're trying to communicate a message. We're trying to participate as an act of worship, right? So that's like the the deeper stuff, you know, the 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 stuff that matters. In not that another language, for instance, doesn't sound differently to the ear. Um, but it's what is meant by that language that is spoken that, uh, that really matters. Uh, you, you know, um, when I was, uh, listening to you, Father Turbo, and you were saying that there was something else there in this missionary Baptist church that you attended when you were younger, um, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that missionary Baptist churches are um, essentially different than other Protestant churches. But what I am here to say is that the missionary Baptist church is far more orthodox than other kinds of Baptist churches. And I think that at least for me, that's what has um, kept me being able to continue working the job that I'm working um, uh, when it has been at the expense of my ability to regularly attend the church that I belong to is because there is this orthodoxy and there still is although it's it's come under attack there still is a reverence and respect of god's order of things you know you know this whole you know patriarchy is taking a lot of uh you know it's it's like a favorite whipping boy of of most everyone these days but <laughs> patriarchy in its essence is a good thing <laughs> it's not a bad thing you know um and as uh, a lot of these different sort of versions of christianity and in religions in general have sort of began to bend the knee to the sort of uh, feminist agenda it has it, what it has done it is has in record numbers and especially in the black church black men are leaving they're leaving the church because there doesn't seem to be something there that is speaking to them and uh for them um and i'm not here to attack the you know the uh, protestant churches or black churches or anything like that that's not that's not the point but I think the my, my point is, for me, the answer to that problem was orthodoxy. That was the answer to that problem. If I forgive me, if I could, I just want to highlight something. Um, and to be to be clear, I uh, I didn't interpret it that way at all because. For me, it was the people that were at that Missionary Baptist Church that were serious. And to drive my point home, um, there was a period. I, I, I re by the way, I realized that. By yeah. the way, I just wanted to clarify. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. But to, to drive that point home, because I think it's really pertinent to the to the conversation. Um, there was a period of my time, which is very common actually, where you know it's kind of like I have these multiple adolescent phases where. I'll get into something, a style of music or whatever. And then like, I kind of, oh, I'm, I'm beyond that. And I, I don't want anything to do with it, you know? And then I kind of come back around to it. That's what happens when you're into a lot of genres and things like that. So at any rate, for various reasons, no need to get into it necessarily here. Um, but there, I went through a, a season of time where I really, to put it lightly, um, I, I didn't appreciate um, my background as an African American, um, particularly, you know, my my grandmother on my father's side was a Pentecostal minister. 
Um, my mother was very deeply involved in her church, you know, so there's, there's roots there for me. And it wasn't until actually I started um, going to Platina, uh, St. Herman of Alaska Monastery in Platina. And um, the now abbot, um, Abbot Damascene, um, he wasn't the abbot at the time, but him and some of the other fathers there, they started giving, they, they started, they gave me like a tape on gospel music. They're like, oh, do you ever listen to any gospel music? I was like, ah, I don't, I wasn't there to want to listen to gospel music. And it, and it was interesting because it was through them that I began to really appreciate my roots again. And the reason why I bring that up is because the gospel that they, the gospel music that they gave me, which wasn't all just pure gospel, right? They, they also, um, Father Damascene also gave me um, Blind Willie Johnson, which is like one of my favorites to this day, right? What, it, what was it? There was a gravitas to the music that they gave me. And whether it was Blind Willie, you know, playing his, you know, form of Delta Blues, or whether it was the Fist Jubilee Singers, there was a seriousness that was there. There was the seriousness, and there was an otherworldliness that was there that you could grab onto. And, and I think that's, that's really the thing that I find consistent because to, um, Dr. Batinov's point, anyone who's got a human heart, right? You can open your heart or your ears to, you know, let's not say a myriad, but if you're presented with a myriad of music, you'll be able to pull out certain gems that will touch you. And what you'll find is, and I, I, there's a measure of being subjective, but there's also a measure where, where we're talking objectively about something. And what you'll find is there are some key things that, that will run through there, right? And I think that this is, this is really important to take in mind because one of the issues that we, one of the things that's kind of in the background playing is we would like to see some sort of intersection happen. Um, and the, um, that intersection going beyond just kind of episodic, um, kind of events. We would like to see something really kind of sprout up organically and have, and have a life in regards of Orthodox uh, life, Orthodox church and African-American experience. Um, but the thing that's missing in many ways are, is part of what this discussion is really trying to hopefully nail down in a more concrete way for the future, uh, a path by which people who are interested and feel led by the Lord to really facilitate some of these things, that there's going to be some sort of common um, order, some sort of common map, some sort of common recipe book that people will pull from. And, you know, there's, there's 30 different ways to have gumbo, but there's a certain thread that's there that eventually you go like, I've had 30 gumbos, but it's all gumbo. But but the thing is, we need to we need to know what are we making, you know? Because gumbo isn't split pea soup, right? So I think this is again in, in regards to kind of guiding the conversation. Some of these some of these ways that we're talking about experiences that can be dangerously subjective. And what I mean dangerously subjective is that they will keep us kind of spinning the wheels versus narrowing down more and more and more like what what is that thing insofar as you know trying to catch the wind if you will but what is that thing that we all keep encountering that we can kind of begin to try to put our finger on you know if if i might um thank you father turbo uh, that i wanted to maybe just Following up from what you said, push back a little against my friend and, and uh, colleague, uh, Peter Buteneff, um, just on the phrase, just the clothing. I mean, that's one of the things about Orthodox music is that on the one hand, it really is the one way, given that since the 15th century, we more or less use all the same services, that it's the, it's the one real way that, that Orthodox liturgy indigenizes, is enculturated with the different musical traditions. Um, but at the same time that there is 
within each of those traditions that has arisen a kind of that depth, that seriousness of purpose that you've talked about, that you and, and uh, Dr. Wallace also saw in the missionary Baptist churches as, as well. And precisely, I think that's one of the things that in, in this historical moment where you're dealing with a country of, of uh, largely immigrants, people brought there either willingly or unwillingly, to uh, the uh, to the United States, um, and then without that, those many centuries of historical depth, you know, what what do we do? How do we proceed forward? Because that's the way orthodoxy has really usually had indigenization over a very long durée. I uh, I'm glad to be pushed again back, especially by such a dear and longtime friend. Um, you're absolutely right, of course, Alex. Um, about, uh, well, among other things, I think part of what I think you might be saying is that it's impossible to uh, extricate the, the content from the form, right? I mean, uh, uh, as, as Rob Saylor has said in many uh, different ways in his writing, um, the faith is always embodied. The, 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 the message is always takes some kind of a form and uh, that form is going to be through words, through music, through the senses, you know, and such that, you know, as St. As, as Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels and such, and we don't even know the treasure apart from those vessels, you know, and so those vessels of different cultures are uh, indispensable and, and they somehow kind of, uh, they're, they're not entirely teasable apart from the core, from the message. Um, I guess what I was just trying to say is that um, miraculously that same uh, message and some of the same things were, some of the qualities that we're trying to talk about here is seriousness, uh, integration, anti-dualism, uh, uh, joyful sorrow, that these can be uh, found Maybe earlier I misspoke. I was almost saying like, despite the music, but what I meant to say is in and through very different musical uh, forms. Uh, I, I appreciate this, uh, this, this exchange. Mother Catherine. So our, our Orthodox faith is based on revelation and revelation is by definition then top down so that builds a hierarchy so we were talking about patriarchy feminism all these things uh our own generation is so deep in mired in materialism that anything that pertains to that spiritual hierarchy can be assailed but that's exactly what we have to preserve that keeps it orthodox so based on revelation, the music needs to take us back up that pyramid toward God. And um, it can't just be what's popular. It can't just be what resonates. Yes, but it has to be the spirit that resonates more than the form. So I'm thinking about uh, Manishka Mikaela when she first entered an Orthodox church and turned to the to Father Paisius, the future Father Paisius, and said, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be Orthodox. You know, it was something of that spirit. And if a person is looking for that, if they're hungry for that. So, you know, we have to keep attention between um, keeping our eye on that revelatory characteristic of Orthodoxy and wanting to embody that. And forms that resonate with people it has to be both and yeah i i i uh yeah both and uh, yeah so it seems like what we're talking about is a sort of balancing act between the sort of otherworldliness that we want to experience as we go into uh an orthodox church for worship right and the language that we need to use to communicate the message Right. So you have to speak in a language that people understand, but we don't want that to take away from the otherworldliness 
that they experience. And uh, yeah, that's like the the needle that we're trying to thread with all of this. Let me pick up on that just because um, I, I want to pull together some of these really profound threads that we've been laying out here and think about our own present moments. You know, we In our national moment of reckoning following the murder of George Floyd, new questions are being asked. It's, it's not that situations are new. It's not that these modes of oppression haven't been around for a long, long time, but new questions are being asked both about the role of the church and the role of arts organizations like Capella Romana, like the um, Institute for Sacred Arts, when it comes to matters of racial justice specifically. So what can the church by being the church bring to this moment of reckoning? And specifically when it comes to the modes of beauty and music that we're talking about, what does that bring to this national conversation? Well, if I could, you know, I would just start with that and, and um, dovetailing off of what Mother Catherine um, very poignantly put, it, put forward to us to remind us. And I think what the church needs to do is, is to stay in the church and, and do what the church does, which is to bring men to remembrance of themselves. We just went through um, both the prodigal son um, as well as the publican and the Pharisee. And in both, both those Sundays, I was trying to uh, bring the point home uh, to my parish that um, in both cases you have, um, you have a situation of people not remembering themselves forgetting themselves you know the prodigal son it's only until he comes to himself if he, he sees himself he remembers himself that he he rises and he goes to his father's house um, when you look at you know the 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 pharisee and although the pharisee prayed you know quote unquote correct in form there was the forgetting of himself because he was not aware of the need that he still had of god he wasn't aware of his humbleness, the need for his humbleness before God. And although the, the publican, the sinner he was, he knew who he was and he was aware. He remembered that he was that sinner, which allowed him to enter rightly before God. Right. So he was he was accounted righteous because he remembered himself and he humbled himself, therefore, before God. And I think that the that piece of revelation and understanding that that is the key meaning fundamentally we aren't trying to and we should never fall in the trap that most of the churches um and this is not a jab we're just talking i'm talking technically speaking including much of the roman catholic church um forget the call and, and end up chasing something else how do we become more relevant how do we get more people how do we make people more feel more better whatever the case is that's a forgetting of, of, of yourself. Our charge is to be a people set apart. And we are to honor that charge by remembering ourselves. And when we remember ourselves in that sense, we'll do what we need to do. You know, in, in my own work with people who have gone through significant things, uh, their own you know, moments and points of trauma, I'm always trying to get someone to remember themselves to not have themselves be subsumed and lost to whatever terrible experience that has, you know, taken them over. And I think that this is more than ever what the world needs because let us not forget, we've entered a new age and this new age, which some people have rightly coined the dim age is a time in which much is going to be lost and is already lost. And, in some regards, without any type of sensationalism, some could argue that the Orthodox Church is like the, the kind of lodestone that's left to kind of point to deeper truths, which affect every aspect of us, right? Because it, here's the other piece of it. The traumas, the, 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 the pain, the anguish, the fear, all the things that were the result of you know this last year and this season of you know outrage and protest 
and, and riot and all of the things that have happened in all kinds of areas, right? This comes from a people, and, and I don't mean necessarily just African-Americans, but just as human beings, as Americans, wherever there was some sort of unrest, when people don't, when people lose a sense of themselves being connected and being made in the image of God, this is the fruit of it. And so there's contemplative aspects that the church puts forward in a very implied way. It's an implied contemplative, you know, experience. And that's important because when it becomes too explicit, then it becomes self-conscious. And then, you know, you're, you're not able to really communicate in any authentic way. And then people just feel like, oh, this is another gimmick. See, that's, that's one of the things is, again, it, it has to be really, as Mother said, it has to be birthed out of this understanding of revelation and a desire to stay steadfast and faithful to that, not out of a kind of subconsciousness that's, that's more informed by any type of, you know, kind of political uh, paradigm, but rather a, a remembering of oneself so that one can, you know, maintain health and integrity of person. And that's one of the, that's one of the things that the liturgy does for us. We offer the liturgy for, you know, for Christ's sake and, and for our sake as well. But that's one of the things that it does for us is it, it maintains that integrity for us as human beings. It keeps the whole person together. So I think this is one of the things to, to keep in mind. And that's a way that just by maintaining that line, if you will, and offering the world strong medicine, strong drink, not nothing diluted, right? Because we know we know where that leads. We know where that leads. We we need to, you know, keep the chrism as it needs to be passed down so that it can do the work, right? And that's what the world's needing in regards of issues of reconciliation, right? Yeah, I should be playing the organ now too. Um <laughs> Yeah, facts, facts. Um, so, uh, yeah, so remember that this whole thing started because a black man was killed, okay? And there's a long history of this sort of disproportionate violence against black men, okay? there's a long history of that and uh there has been sort of uprisings in the past and they last for a time and then they uh dissipate and then nothing really different has really happened it's really still been the same issues in fact i would argue that the issues have become worse but what the politicians and the, uh, you know, certain groups have been able to do is they've been able to use the attention that this sort of violence against black men has sort of brought certain things to, you know, to a head. They use that attention to serve whatever agenda that they have. We get passed over. You know, black black men get passed over. Um, we are the least catered to group as black men. You know, and uh, one thing that the Orthodox Church will never do is uh, invalidate the humanity of every person. We matter. God sees us. <laughs> you know, um, and, uh, you know, much of what you see on the news, um, uh, and what, you, and much of what I've experienced, uh, you know, in academia, um, in different work you know walks of life different things that i that i do is 
yeah, it seems that right now people are willing or more willing to have a, a conversation. But I remember, you know, I have a memory. I know how this stuff usually goes. So it's hard to trust that this how somehow this is going to be different. And actually, you can see how, in most respects, how it's not any different at all. Because the same sorts of things have, have crept up and this leaving in their wake the same problems. You know, um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, so the church is always the answer. Um, you know, actually valuing men and having a specific place where we are to serve in a manner by which we are to serve. Um, that matters, you know, um. Uh, and again, it's one of the reasons why orthodoxy is so appealing to me is that as, as was just said, the strong drink that comes with it, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So I'd like to segue off of what both of you have said. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, in addition to being true to itself and helping us come to ourselves through that, um, I have a vision where the Orthodox Church could in some way acknowledge uh, our, our enslaved forebears who gave their blood and their lives to pray, to pray to Christ. In, in almost every Orthodox country, uh, the blood of the martyrs has been the seed of the church. And there's been honor towards uh, the first ones who shed their blood for Christ. And um, the fellowship has over the years collected the names and martyrologies, both in Wade and the River and in Unbroken Circle, uh, of people who have uh, enslaved men and women who were uh, forbidden to pray because the enslavers feared that either, either they would pray for freedom or that they would pray against the master and so we have those who are confessors, we have those who gave their blood. Now, you know, in the early centuries, before there were any denominations, you had baptism by blood. So a person didn't have to be baptized into the church if they shed their blood for Christ. Um, St. Boniface was one of those who was leading a very dissolute life, witnessed the martyrdom of um, some of the saints and said, oh, I'm one of them. And then he also was martyred and it was, it was, you know, that quick, that immediate. Now that you have denominations, I'm not saying that the Orthodox Church can say that people who never, never heard of Orthodoxy can then be retrofitted as Orthodox saints, but there can be some way to honor them, whether it's, um, as Deacon Jonathan Rivas suggested, um, historical scenes of their suffering, perhaps, or triumph in, nar in narthexes of certain parishes that were open to that, or whether it could be uh, non-liturgical songs that were still written in an orthodox ethos. Well, I knew coming into this conversation that it would be viscerally painful for me to bring it to a close. Uh, so much good. Um, I, I'm, I actually can't say enough how touched I am by a number of things that have come up in our all too brief time together. Um, speaking for myself, and I imagine speaking for many of those who will be listening, um, I've heard much to ponder, talk of bright sadness, talk of deep truth telling, talk of... Um, the strong medicine 
of the church and as it relates to beauty. One thing I want to make very clear again is our hope that this will be an ongoing conversation, not just among those of us who work in these areas directly, but across the whole church and across all those who it touches and across all of the many people who make up the listenership of Capella Romana and the viewership of the Institute for Sacred Arts. I want to especially thank Father Turbo, Mother Catherine, Dr. Wallace, and Dr. Petenia for joining us today. And I, in this Lenten season, I wish deep blessings upon us all. Thank you so much.